space. And I will hope to hear from you soon. Nice. Do you think she'll message me back? <laughs> yeah, no. Me too. Hello and welcome to The D View, where there's a 0% chance of hearing that something is good, there's a 0% chance of hearing that something is bad, and there's a 100% chance that this is it. This is the one. Here we go! <coughs> Fuck! Super Mario Galaxy is not a game about space, it's a game about balls. Great news for me, I love balls. 2007 was a very top-heavy year for video games. Bioshock gave players one of the most disorienting plot twists ever seen in the medium, Portal forced gamers to engage their brains more than they had done since the turn of the millennium, and Assassin's Creed... What Mario was doing in 2007 was innovating gravity into its mechanics. Nothing like this had been done on this scale before, but almost every surface, every chunk of floating frozen game juice in Mario Galaxy has its own gravitational pull. It sucks you back in if you try and leave without enough propulsion, and often the most convenient way to leave is simply by crossing over into the gravity of another big floating ball, like you're constantly ping-ponging across both sides of an Italian Venn diagram. I feel it needs to be said that I did not play Super Super Mario Galaxy when it first came out in 2007. As a matter of fact, I didn't play Super Mario Galaxy until the year 2020 when Nintendo so graciously decided to release this actual felony. So I am speaking from the perspective of someone who played Super Mario Galaxy for the first time on the Nintendo Switch with a pro controller, whom has no real nostalgia for or emotional connection to this game and already had a reasonable idea of what they were getting themselves into. I mean the plot doesn't exactly break any new ground, Peach gets kidnapped by Bowser again, but then shortly after the game's opening, it does its first of many inexplicably weird things. It fills the game's peach-shaped black hole by simply replacing her with a taller and no doubt more likely to ask to speak to the manager version. Some people love this character, but outside of the confines of Super Mario Galaxy, she has hurt me deeply on countless occasions, and so for the purposes of this deview, she will be referred to as Space Peach. Perhaps Space Peach's case would be helped were her five-pointed friends more similar to the characterful and aesthetically interesting piantas from Super Mario Sunshine, but all they really seem to do is ask you to feed them, scream, and explode. Often in that order. This chucklehead over here tells you as you walk past him, this couch is the comfiest, when there are only two couches present in the game's entire hub, making that a very unremarkable feat, and worse, he's not even sitting on it. You are fake, Luma. Stop trying to be my friend. Piantas from Super Mario Sunshine, these are not. This hub, the Comet Observatory, starts out mostly in shadow, as it needs to be powered up by the stars you'll be collecting throughout the game. At the risk of sounding like a crotchety old man at 23 years old, this is the kind of mystery that's missing from games nowadays. Young players playing Mario Galaxy for the first time would have seen all these silhouetted shapes and domes and platforms and wondered what kind of levels awaited them, fantasised about all the places they were going to be going to. Hell, if I'd played this game for the first time in 2000, and seven, I probably would have been one of them. It brings to mind my memories of playing the original Spyro trilogy as a kid, and particularly in Spyros 2 and 3, just sitting gawking at the portals, reading the names of the levels and wondering what I was about to get myself into before I even went in. I probably spent more time staring at these portals than I did in the levels themselves. Everything about them, from these fantastical skyboxes to their location in the hub, to the very arch that framed them, appealed to my imagination. And nearly two decades later, Super Mario Galaxy is one of very few games to have ever awoken that dormant feeling of childlike wonderment in me, to truly make me have to see what's next. Super Mario Galaxy's obfuscation of its own hub world lends to a sense of discovery quite unlike so many games from the late 2000s onwards, but as you collect the stars and reveal so much more of it, it also lends itself to a far more tangible sense of progression. Not only does the observatory itself get brighter and more populated, but even the music changes. The Comet Observatory's theme song starts out sounding like a sleepy and almost melancholic lullaby to reflect its state of stasis, but as you power it up and slowly bring it back to life, these powerful brass and string instruments start seeping into it, reflecting the observatory's newfound vibrancy. The observatory's theme becomes this tour de force from a full-on orchestra, and the player is shown how their success is making this a better place. When going from the observatory to a level, a few times over you'll be shown another of the exceptionally weird cards Mario Galaxy
galaxy holds in its hand. Every galaxy you can visit is represented on the selection screen by a basic, slightly slanted top-down view of said galaxy. But when you're on your way to a boss fight in one of Bowser's designated galaxies, said galaxy is represented by a picture of Bowser's giant head. Is this suggesting that the galaxies are shaped like Bowser's head? Because I mean, there's like six of them, and none of them seem to resemble Bowser's head, but then they are supposedly galaxies, and we are incredibly small by comparison. Imagine that. Imagine having an entire galaxy that, when observed from space, was shaped just like your head. Not only would that, for a megalomaniacal villain like Bowser, be very auspicious, but it's also one step away from being a Junji Ito series. Space is so big and so scary. <laughs> Do you ever think about it? About how big it is? And about how small we all are by comparison? I mean, not me, I'm, I'm a famous YouTuber, but you? Do you ever think about how small you are? Because if you haven't, I think you should. In fact, I'll, I'll give you a moment to reflect on that. I'm big. You're small. Most platformers put an emphasis on speed and fluidity, but being set in space, Mario Galaxy feels comparatively floaty. Its platforming is often slow and deliberate, which I feel gives it a very distinct identity. While there are many moments of standing in place and just waiting. There are also lots of moments where you need to be meticulous and carefully plan your movements. For better or for worse, this game will teach you patience. And in case what I'm saying isn't making it clear enough yet, yes, Mario Galaxy is a game for serial killers. It's also a game that proves that platformers don't always need to be about jumping. There's another game I'd love to debut one day that also shows that off, though in that game's case it's largely because the protagonist doesn't have feet. Galaxy doesn't have you jumping so much as it often has you just moving carefully. In Gusty Garden Galaxy, you you maneuver around these twisting spirals of dirt, chasing and unearthing moles as you go. In Beach Bowl Galaxy, you navigate a series of diverting paths whilst trying to avoid being crushed by what I can only assume to be the Thwomp's conservative cousin. And in Toy Time Galaxy, you are carefully tiptoeing around every side of this huge climbing frame-like structure, trying to flip switches and again not get killed by Stone Age SpongeBob over here. All three of these examples require comparatively little jumping in contrast with most Mario levels, but they still constitute platforming challenges. Between its many floating planetoids and constantly coiling camera, Mario Galaxy has a cult-like ability to warp your perspective. Space is a setting that the 3D Mario design team have clearly wanted to go to for a very long time. Whether you choose to believe it or not, every Mario platformer before Mario Galaxy wanted to be Mario Galaxy. Since it's a different question, I don't think Odyssey gives a shit about anything. Sure, run around in circles for a moon, fuck it, why not? But in games in which you actually jump to and from platforms, it's clear that the design team are yearning for space. They have always wanted to just put random shit out in the open air and say, this is the level. Mario 64 likely looks that way because of technical limitations, but still, look at Lethal Lava Land. What is Lethal Lava Land? It looks like I emptied my university dorm bin into a big pot of bolognese. Sunshine is somewhat more grounded with its setting. A lot of the platforms are made to naturally blend in with the level's scenery, but then you've got the secret levels. The secret levels of Super Mario Sunshine wish so hard that they could be Super Mario Galaxy. You mean to tell me that this isn't space? Look at this nonsense. It's just stuff floating. Space is the big boy playground, and until Mario Galaxy, 3D Mario was a quivering little cub with a Monsters Inc. lunchbox. Now that they have access to all these new toys, they can play around with gravity and perspective. They can make levels that are literally just stuff strewn about the place, floating in midair like they've always wanted, and it can be semi-believable. I say semi-believable because, I mean, Big Mouth Galaxy? You mean to tell me that this is a galaxy? This this dead fish with a big mouth constitutes its own galaxy? This is like M&M's World all over again. Have you ever been to an M&M's World before? There's like five of them. There's one in Shanghai, there's a few in America, and there's, there's one in London. It's ridiculous. Look at these pictures I took in the London M&M's World when I went there with a friend a few years back. Are, are M&M's really this important? Well, look at this stuff. Do you really think they need their own world dedicated to them? Multiple worlds at that? No. No, they don't. Free of the constraints of a more limited setting, Mario Galaxy goes wild by taking you to these fantastical places unlike anything Mario has ever seen before, such as the beach, a haunted house, a cold place, a less cold place, the beach again, 
and an even less cold place. Mario Galaxy's ideas run rampant. It has you playing around with launch stars, pool stars, and sling pods. On the three or so levels, it has you infiltrating a spaceship or drifting through the cosmos. You're using bullet bills to smash open glass casing to progress, or racing a ghost through an asteroid field. Whose idea was this one? I'm not mad or anything, I promise. I, I just want to talk. <laughs> Seriously, come here, let's have a chat. And then it takes it further. Boo Mario! No, no, I meant that there's a power-up, which allows you to float and move through walls. B Mario lets you fly for a limited time and stick to certain surfaces. And then, about 80% of the way through the main game, Mario Galaxy presents us with exhibit number three in its Museum of Weirdness. Not long before our first final battle with Bowser, Super Mario Galaxy throws you arguably the most shocking plot twist the series has ever seen by revealing its true final villain, one far more heinous than Bowser could ever hope to be in the form of Spring Mario. Not unlike Sora being possessed by darkness should he overuse his drive forms in Kingdom Hearts, Mario occasionally finds himself overtaken by the wicked Spring Mario, now capable of jumping to greater heights than ever before, but incapable of moving like any normal human being or even feeling love. Only after the credits roll and Bowser is defeated are you likely to conquer Spring Mario by overcoming his sinister influence in this treacherous gauntlet at the end of Matter Splatter Galaxy. Here in Matter Splatter Galaxy, Spring Mario will kill you a lot and he will waste valuable moments of time in your actual real life. Guys, we only have so much time on this planet, okay? Don't waste it on Spring Mario. Waste it on me. On the subject of ideas, Mario Galaxy handles them with a similar level of inconsistency to just about every other Mario game. Some galaxies, like Bubble Breeze and Rolling Green Galaxy, only show up for one star, and maybe those mechanics are used once again across the entire game? They made whole levels with unique gimmicks just to use them once and do away with them after. And yet there are literally two levels where you race a ghost? Seriously, whose idea was this? I just want to talk. Super Mario Galaxy has a lot of bosses that come back with fake moustaches for extra free samples, and while the orchestral soundtrack hits levels of grandiosity that Mario had never seen up until that point, the game has like 12 or 13 or so level songs that I counted that stretch across 40 or so galaxies that you'll visit numerous times. So many of the game's ideas and level concepts are fleshed out to a reasonable extent, but some others are left behind in the dust, even if some of them do belong there. And this is where the prankster comment come in. Long before Celeste's B and C sides or Rayman Legends invasions or any other platformer remixing previous levels so they can have more content in their game without having to make new assets came along, were Mario Galaxy's prankster comets. I say long before, there, there probably was another game that did this before Galaxy, but if there was then I can't think of it right now, which makes it less important. The prankster comets allow you to retry previously existing levels under new stipulations. You can go back to a level now having to collect 100 purple coins. You can go back to a level but now the enemies are super fast. Their appearances add a sense of spontaneity to the game, giving you a chance to grab a star that wasn't previously available. On the note of extra stars, apparently Luigi's in this game? Have you guys seen him? I can't find him anywhere. When thinking about Mario Galaxy structure, the Leaning Tower of Pisa comes to mind. When re-entering a level, Mario 64 encourages you to go a different way and look in different places for stars. The levels are open sandboxes. When re-entering a level in Mario Galaxy, sometimes it just changes things without telling you, and that becomes your new set path through the level. I'm a YouTuber, okay? I don't like change. I want to do the same thing for 10 years and call it a life. You know, I said that as a joke, but I feel like some people might take it seriously. And I just want to say that doing the exact same thing for 10 years is like my worst fear in life. Well, maybe not my worst fear. We'll talk about that when we deviewed this game, but yeah. It's also occurred to me that I think people might comment on how I just said I don't like change and how outright saying I do or don't like things doesn't belong in the DV. Um, firstly, when I say that you're not going to hear me outright say that I think anything is good or bad, I mean that in reference to the game and the game only. You know, in the Skyward Sword DV, I talked about a bad thing my friend did and someone commented on how I'd broken my own rules and I'm like, well, it doesn't have anything to do with the game. You know, if it's not related to the game, it doesn't count. Also, um, don't don't take this series too seriously. You know, I'm getting people being like, damn, I feel like I kind 
kind of know how you feel about this one, bro. Or the D view is great, but I feel like you said insert a thing here that kind of contradicts the rules. And like, yeah, like I say, don't don't take it seriously. Like I didn't intend for the series to be taken particularly seriously at all. It's just it's just supposed to be fun. I've even had a few people say that they'd love to see bigger outlets pick up the concept and run with it. And, and while I really do appreciate that people are enjoying it that much, uh, I think that would be terrible. Uh, like if IGN or something started trying to do D views, Jesus Christ, how the, how the fuck would that even work? Maybe, maybe if you're as weird as me, you could pull it off. But yeah, in my mind, it's a series that's just really conceptually dumb. And that's why it's so funny to me. Whilst I do actually try and stick to the rules pretty hard, I am almost definitely going to break them sometimes, whether intentionally or not. And when I do, I like to think it'll just be funny, you know, like just have fun with the D view. Just, just hang out with it. It's hard to ever really get a grip on Mario Galaxy. There's so much change. It's always changing. They introduced the boom mushroom only to use it in three levels. They changed the layout and pathing of galaxies between stages. They introduced gimmicks and mechanics just to drop them shortly after. Some people think this allows them to prevent them from overstaying their welcome. Some think there's no point introducing them if they're not going to fully utilize them. Such is the nature of outer space, eh? Things change. Stars explode and die out. Planets are born. Other things happen, I'm sure. Mario Galaxy clearly believes that not all ideas are created equal, and I mean, much like the first game I deviewed, it is on the Wii. So, how much do the motion controls insist on themselves? Themself? It itself? I think, I think it's plural. There are multiple ways motion control is, is used, and I do think of it as kind of like an, an alien hive mind that lives inside your controller. Um, probably looks like one of those weird, creepy Yu-Gi-Oh cards with a big eye. Well, if Skyward Sword was a disturbingly extroverted roommate who accosted you every time you left your room to ask about life and how your week was, then Mario Galaxy is an aunt who is a bit too nosy, but will get the hint once you tell her that what you're up to lately is eating and sleeping. In Mario Galaxy, you can pick up star bits, the game's main collectible, by pointing at them on the screen, and you can also shoot them at enemies to temporarily immobilize them, because they were such threats otherwise. Motion controls are used for selecting galaxies and navigating pool stars and a couple galaxy specific level gimmicks, but thankfully I haven't run into Dowsing Damsel Galaxy just yet. I haven't been able to find the source of this anywhere, and maybe someone in the comments can bring it up and they know where to find proof of this, but I remember hearing once that the reason you can point at and pick up star bits during the little cutscenes where Mario flies into the galaxy is because the designers were worried about too much dead air? Like they thought the player would get bored or something? If so, that's a very unconventional way to to remedy this problem, and the more I think about it, the more I'm starting to think I, I just dreamt this. I do have some pretty weird dreams. I had a dream I was a, a masked vigilante fighting crime in some kind of urban city the other week, and a, a bit like Zorro, I had like an insignia, but instead of leaving behind like a cool Z, I drew a leddy face every time. Hang on, was that actually real? No, I don't think it was. Fuck. Going back to Super Mario Galaxy well over a decade later, motion controls on a different console with a pro controller were but one of the many questions I had, alongside, will the game hold up today? Are people's perception of this game carried by nostalgia? And when will Americans learn that could care less means they do care? That last one isn't related to the game at all, but it is a question I have. I've heard that Shigeru Miyamoto and Yoshiaki Koizumi clashed quite a bit over this game. Miyamoto is infamous for not really caring for story in his games and not feeling the need to explain things, and this is one of the few areas where Koizumi supposedly got him to relent, at least just a little bit, with some of the added backstory for Space Peach and a couple other things. I think this clash of styles is evident in Mario Galaxy. Imagine that disturbingly extroverted roommate I metaphorized earlier was making a piece of art, and he brings on the far more reserved guy who lives two doors away from him and stays up all night watching Netflix to work on it with him. This game feels like the civil yet simmering debates that come as a result. It's like looking at an argument on a piece of paper. It's a bit all over the place, but it's also bold and fascinating, and it's something that an unfeeling machine would never be able to replicate. At least, not for a bit anyway. I mean, 3D printing is fucking crazy, bro. <laughs> Have you seen some of the stuff people can 3D print? They can print like guns. I'm pretty sure you can print new body parts, right? Damn, where's my where's my gun arm at? <laughs> and then you've got like Google Glass and VR and all, all this other crazy stuff. Yeah, M maybe a machine could make Mario Galaxy. Not right now, but like, I don't know, maybe next week? Whatever, man, I, I don't know. Shit's crazy.